Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Reggie. I'm uh, the physician liaison with Rothman Orthopedics. Um, tonight, uh, thank you so much for everybody for joining us this evening. We will be recording this lecture and sending it out to everyone who is registered. Uh, this evening's uh, virtual lecture will be given by Dr. Justin Sai, who is one of our orthopedic foot and ankle surgeons here at Rothman Orthopedics. Uh, Dr. Sai is currently seeing patients uh, at Harrison, uh, Westchester, Tarrytown, Paramus, New Jersey, and Madison Avenue in Manhattan. Uh, the topic that Dr. Sai will be speaking on today is foot and ankle sports surgeries. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the lecture, you could type them into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, and we'll go through each of them at the end of the pr uh, presentation. And I will turn it over to you, Dr. Sai. All right, thank you, Reggie. Let me just uh, share my screen here. Uh, okay. All right, how's that looking? Looks perfect. Okay, great. All right, thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Reggie. Uh, and thank you all for uh, joining us again. Uh, today, we'll be talking about uh, foot and ankle injuries in the athlete. Uh, as uh, Reggie mentioned, my name's Justin Sai. Uh, I'm an orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon with Roth and Orthopedics New York. So, just a little bit about myself. Uh, you know, I did my uh, undergraduate education at Cornell University, then went on to do uh, both medical school and residency at uh, SUNY Downstate, uh, which is an academic center in Brooklyn. And then uh, after that, I did a, uh, a fellowship in foot and ankle orthopedic surgery, uh, surgery uh, at uh, Thomas Jefferson University Hospital with the uh, Rothman Institute. So I, I am a foot and ankle orthopedic surgeon, uh, and I see patients um, uh, of any age, and are really uh, seeing patients that have uh, all sorts of conditions related to the foot and ankle. This is part of uh, uh, the field that drew me um, uh, to it in the first place, the variety of conditions that I see. Uh, this can include anything from uh, bunions and hammer toes to complex deformities such as uh, flat foot or, or high arches, uh, arthritis of the ankle and the joints in the foot, uh, as well as tendon and sports injuries, which we'll uh, be talking about today. And as Reggie mentioned, I do see patients uh, and operate in, in three different counties. Uh, I see patients in Manhattan. Uh, I'm giving a lecture right now from our uh, a new Madison Avenue office, in the corner of uh, 60th and Madison. I also see patients in Paramus, New Jersey, as well as uh, at two office locations in Westchester, uh, one uh, in uh, Tarrytown and one in uh, uh, Harrison. So in terms of a general outline of what I'll be talking about today, uh, really, three of the most common injuries we see in athletes, not only uh, in elite athletes, uh, like you see depicted here, but also in your everyday athlete, whether that's uh, youth sports or uh, in, in the weekend warrior. And uh, generally, these three injuries can be broadly divided into, you know, ankle sprains, foot and ankle fractures, and tendon injuries. And uh, you know, one goal today, among others, is to relay to you, you know, when these injuries are serious and when they uh, require more than simply treating yourself as, you know, every athlete uh, is probably used to doing, you know, everyone knows to ice, elevate, stay off it. But when does, uh, when do these injuries require uh, more advanced treatment? And I'll try to relay that to you. So let's start off with uh, ankle sprains. So ankle sprains are probably most common reason I see patients in the office for, uh, for athletes. Uh, and basically, uh, in its most basic definition, a sprain is when there's a force that overwhelms the natural elasticity of a ligament. Uh, and a ligament is a structure that connects two bones. And so I think about a sprain uh, like a, a t-shirt collar. So uh, normally, uh, you know, you can take a t-shirt collar and, and stretch it out to a certain amount and it kind of rebounds to its uh, normal shape. When you kind of overwhelm it, when you pull on it too much or you wear it too many times, it kind of, um, you know, kind of assumes this wrinkled state where it's just permanently loose. Uh, and, you know, it's not a perfect analogy because sprains usually do heal and regain over time, but that, that's the idea of a sprain that doesn't heal over time. And 
basically ankle sprains can be divided into low ankle sprains and high ankle sprains and majority of what we see uh, and treat are, are low ankle sprains. So just a quick overview of the anatomy, the ankle joint itself is made up of three bones. Uh, the bone to the outside, which has kind of minimal weight bearing um, uh, characteristics, but helps support the ankle on the outside. It's called the fibula. Uh, the shin bone, uh, the distal end of it, or the, or the end towards the ankle is called the tibia. Uh, and then you have the bottom part of the ankle joint called the talus. In the ankle joint itself, uh, it's lined by cartilage, which provides a smooth gliding surface for uh, movement of the ankle. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, connecting uh, bone to bone are, are the ligaments. And if you look uh, to the top right, you'll see some of the common ligaments we uh, see and, and see injured. Uh, looking from the side or the lateral view, uh, at the outside in, I should say, uh, are your main low ankle ligaments. The ATFL or anterior talofibular ligament, CFL or calcaneofibular ligament, and then the PTFL. On the inside part of your ankle, uh, you know, name for its shape, you'll see the deltoid ligament. And then lastly, uh, this is relevant to high ankle sprains on the bottom left, you'll see ligaments between the two bones, which we generally refer to uh, as the syndesmotic ligaments. So, you know, in terms of a, a mechanism, uh, we divide them uh, uh, in terms of a low ankle sprain, I should say, uh, mostly it happens with inversion. So uh, picture the uh, foot going in uh, and uh, the rest of your ankle going outwards. Uh, as you can imagine, this leads to an injury of the ATFL or CFL where it gets stretched out. And we divide these into uh, graded from one to three based on the level of severity. So uh, one being just small tears and three being a, a complete uh, full thickness rupture. Generally, patients will present with uh, some degree of pain and swelling along with ecchymosis or bruising. Uh, as mentioned earlier, most of this happens on the outside part of the ankle because the ankle tends to buckle in mostly uh, with most sports that we do. Uh, generally, patients will have some degree of difficulty weight bearing. I always get an x-ray when I see these patients in the office. I, I think it's important because you know the next step in an ankle sprain is an ankle fracture. And so, uh, you never want to miss that. And therefore, if they've never had an x-ray before and, and someone's coming to me for the first time for an ankle sprain, I always get a, uh, an x-ray. And at least initially, there's no role for an MRI, uh, mostly because we obtain MRIs to help guide treatment. And initially, um, there's really, for an ankle sprain at least, um, there's no role because it's not going to change our initial management of an ankle sprain. As mentioned before, I always get an x-ray. Initial treatment for your run-of-the-mill ankle sprains is uh, pretty simple. We use a mnemonic called RICE, that's rest, ice, compression, elevation. I always tell patients, keep in mind swelling is painful, uh, and therefore, uh, once we control the swelling, it to a large degree uh, controls the pain. Uh, physical therapy uh, can be utilized afterwards, although uh, most uh, patients will not require this after an initial sprain. And sometimes uh, we utilize bracing or even a boot, depending on the severity of the brace, uh, sorry, of the uh, injury, but that really depends on symptoms. The, the brace and the boot aren't really uh, compressing or causing healing. They're really just helping with the pain and, and preventing another injury from happening during that initial period uh, of injury. So when do we operate on these? Uh, generally, we reserve surgery when there's persistent pain and, and basic timeline, we say, you know, over several months of uh, persistent symptoms. If someone's describing recurrent sprains where they are spraining their ankle with kind of minimal force, that's an uh, indication for surgery. If they're clinically unstable, so we do a test called uh, Taylor Tilt Test or Anterior Drawer. These are manipulation tests where we see how far the ankle is moving uh, and we compare it to a normal side. Uh, usually the opposite side, although a lot of patients have instability on both sides. And this usually has to coincide with a full thickness tear uh, of the ATFL uh, as seen on advanced imaging. And this would be a situation uh, where, as you can see on the uh, middle image right there, x-ray, uh, that's not a normal amount of motion right there. That's way more than you should be able to do. Uh, and if the patient had these other symptoms, then we would certainly uh, consider surgery. And, you know, I think the 
technique and details of the surgery are beyond the scope of this presentation, but basically uh, the surgery is to reconstruct the ligaments on the outside of the ankle. And it, we're not repairing the ligament per se, where you take one end and suturing it to the other, but rather you're, you're shortening a, a ligament that's lengthened. So usually we um, take it off, uh, actually we peel the ligament off one of the bones and put the foot in a dorsiflex and everted position and then tie the ligament back down. And so by bringing the ankle back to a normal position uh, and tying the ankle down in this position, you're kind of restoring the normal length the ligament should have. Uh, there's kind of newer technology, uh, something called an internal brace that I've started to utilize in my practice, uh, which I think of like a seatbelt for your repair, it protects your repair uh, and allows you to start rehab sooner. Uh, this is beneficial because obviously uh, everyone wants to get back to activity as soon as possible. And uh, it, it gives me more confidence uh, to, to allow the patient to do that sooner because the last thing you want to do is, is have the uh, repair stretch out because uh, you're left uh, back at square one. So a high ankle sprain, uh, you know, this is a very prevalent pro problem or uh, gets a lot of attention in, in the media because of uh, injuries to uh you know, sports stars. Uh, most recently, uh, LeBron James uh, suffered a uh, high ankle sprain. And I think this screenshot really captures the mechanism uh, it takes to sustain this type of injury. So unlike the inversion injury where your ankle kind of buckles in uh, and your body sort of falls to the outside, uh, this is more of a rotational injury. So usually the foot's planted to the ground, uh, flat uh, or, you know, slightly off. Uh, and uh, there's an external force uh, coming from the outside. Uh, and depending on which way the player's going, uh, that can spin the uh, ankle uh, to the outside or to the inside rotationally as opposed to bending. And this is when we see an injury to those ligaments we were talking about earlier that span between the tibia and fibula. Uh, these are inherently much more difficult to deal with because now uh, you have a force that's traveling up the whole leg. Sometimes that force is severe enough to cause a, a fracture uh, up at the upper end of the fibula. Uh, you can imagine a force that starts down in the ankle, you get a, a twist and it travels up that membrane and travels out the, the top of the uh, fibula. That's an indication to me usually the force has been sufficient enough uh, to uh, require surgery. And we call this a Masonuve injury. Of course, unstable injuries usually require surgery. If there's an unstable and persistently unstable uh, joint between the uh, fibula and the tibia, that leads to just abnormal contact uh, forces in the ankle, which ultimately can lead to arthritis, which is uh, kind of a devastating complication of a, a sprain. And so, uh, as with all surgery, uh, we, we try to get everything back into the normal position and hold it together until the own ligaments, uh, your damaged ligaments heal. Uh, the way we used to do this on the left side is with screws. Now this, this had its issues. Uh, you know, it's a joint and you're basically putting a screw through a joint which leads to damage and, uh, and uh, broken screws over time. The reason they broke was because the joint's gonna continue to move. Uh, and therefore, we've sort of moved on in, in most situations to flexible fixation basically utilizing a, a really strong uh, piece of suture uh, secured on both sides uh, by a metal button. This lets us maintain the normal flexibility of the joint, uh, but still providing enough fixation so that your own ligaments heal on top of it and you have a secure and stable ankle joint. So uh, let's move on to foot and ankle fractures. Um, you know, fractures can happen to anybody, obviously, uh, but athletes in particular are very prone to getting these injuries. Uh, and that's because there's a tremendous amount of force, not only in, in the athletes themselves, they're usually larger, more muscular, uh, but they're also doing more things that are inherently dangerous or uh, put the ankle at injury, uh, risk of injury. And um, some of these uh, fractures that we see include uh, Jones fractures, stress fractures, ankle fractures, and, and compound fractures, uh, which are basically uh, fractures that uh, come out through the skin uh, to prevent, um, uh, that sort of lead to more challenging treatment given the fact that you're bringing in risks of infection, uh, damage to the muscle around it, 
uh, and even uh, the potential for uh, amputation uh, if the injury is bad enough. So uh, I'll sort of use Jones fractures as an example. Um, a Jones fracture is an eponym. It describes a fracture to the base of the fifth metatarsal. So you'll see that on the bottom left uh, side of the screen there. Uh, you know, the reason that these are more prone to happen uh, uh, of, of all the other bones in the foot is that this is a high tension area. This is an area that gets landed on a lot and it's the watershed zone. And what I mean by that is that uh, there's great blood flow to the bone behind it, great blood flow in front of it. But in this zone, right where these fractures happen, for whatever reason, there's not great blood flow. And this has implications not only in making this an, a high likelihood area of fracture, but also for healing, all right? If there's not great blood flow, it's not gonna heal well. So that sort of changes our algorithm compared to other bones and how we approach these fractures. Risk factor, uh, I always look out for are high arches. Uh, if you're uh, someone with high arches or what we call a supinator, uh, there's inherently more pressure on the outside of the foot. Sometimes uh, this can be a risk factor for refracturing, even through uh, a screw that we put in. And uh, when this happens, you have to seriously consider not only fixing the fracture again, but also correcting the, the arch and, and uh, making it flatter uh, to prevent it from occurring again. And so... Uh, when do we operate on these uh, fractures and why? Uh, it's a fair question. And what I tell patients is, uh, you know, it's more predictable healing. Uh, and generally, there's a faster time to the bone healing and a faster recovery time. Uh, what I mean by more predictable healing is that, you know, after surgery, for the most part, we can, I can give the patient a better timeline. I can say by, you know, four to six weeks, we'll start to see some bone healing uh, in most cases. Uh, after X amount of time, we can start uh, you know, weight bearing and after X amount of time, we can start sports. Uh, whereas the alternative is to do non-operative treatment where um, it's just less, less sure. Everybody's different in terms of their healing and you sort of have to mostly change your predictions at, at every visit when you take new x-rays. <clears throat> so generally the patients that get surgery for this are athletes who, who need to have a more controlled timeline uh, to uh, you know, predict when they're going to return to play, or any highly active indiv individual who really can't afford to lose time uh, and to uh, wait to see whether non-surgical treatment is going to work or not. And so the way we do this surgery uh, is through putting a screw. Uh, it's an intramedullary screw, meaning the screw is on the inside part of the bone and no part of it except the very tip is outside the bone. On the left side here, you'll see the fracture uh, at the outside, uh, progressing all the way through. And uh, this is a screw kind of going through. Uh, and we do this through kind of a minimally invasive technique where uh, you basically need to make a hole big enough just to be able to get the screw uh, uh, through the skin. Nowadays, especially in patients at high risk of developing a non-union or you wanna add even greater chance of healing, we add on biologics, which is a fancy word of saying, uh, a fancy phrase for saying that we take some uh, components from the blood that are promoting of uh, bone healing, and we uh, put that into the fracture site to allow for uh, extra healing or a higher chance of healing. And so this is a, an actual patient of mine. You can see on the left side here, the fracture again. This is uh, a two weeks after surgery. You'll see, you can still see the fracture over here. Uh, this is at about four weeks afterwards. You can start to see the fracture healing, um, you, you know, especially around the margins of the fracture. And finally, uh, this is at about uh, eight weeks where you see uh, almost full bony consolidation. So uh, very predictable. Now, this patient might have done fine with non-surgical uh, treatment. But again, in, in those patients where, you know, there's minimal risks for surgery from a health standpoint and uh, that really need to get back as soon as possible, uh, I believe this is the best uh, treatment option available. Afterwards, non-weight bearing for about six weeks. Uh, then afterwards, that's when physical therapy starts. Uh, they can start weight bearing, uh, you know, uh, in a boot uh, at some point during that time. And generally, there's no return to impact activity until I can uh, demonstrate that there's uh, fracture healing uh, definitely present. And sometimes we need to confirm this with a CT scan uh, if uh, you, know, you really can't afford to have a refracture 
uh, and it's not quite clear on the x-ray whether it's fully healed or not. Uh, <clears throat> just a quick word on stress fracture. So uh, stress fracture, hairline fracture, they're, they're kind of denoting the same thing. And these are fractures where you're not necessarily going to see something on the x-ray. There's no full fracture across, uh, but it's, uh, these occur as a result of repetitive stress below the threshold to break the bone fully. So using another kind of real life uh, uh, analogy, uh, it's like a bending a paper clip multiple times. You know, you start to feel it weaken. That's when you would call something a stress fracture. And then finally, uh, it breaks fully. And that, that represents the devastating consequence of a stress fracture, which is a full on fracture, which depending on the area, um, almost necessitates surgery. Uh, and you can see on the top uh, picture over there, kind of points out not only common areas for stress fractures, but uh, divides them into what we call high risk stress fractures and low risk with high risk uh, denoting the ones that, um, you know, you really can't afford to have go on a full fracture. Uh, and so uh, oftentimes we operate on these when they are just stress fractures to minimize the chance of them progressing to full fracture. Uh, usually patients with stress fractures will complain of pain over a specific area. Uh, some clues in the history I look out for uh, that sort of, uh, uh, you know, pique my interest uh, or, or uh, make me suspicious for a, uh, a stress fracture. Um, you know, someone describing a new training regimen. Classically, the story of a patient with a stress fracture is someone that uh, is training for a marathon for the first time. Uh, they are a, a, a new military recruit who is all of a sudden uh, engaging in, uh, you know, marches and, uh, you know, a lot of physical activity. Usually, the history uh, notes pain worsening over time, and this pain is usually only with weight bearing. Usually, there's no discrete history of injury. So there's no fall. Uh, there's no twisting injury. Uh, it just started hurting, and uh, it's getting worse over time. And so, how do we diagnose these? Well, you know, exams are first clue. Usually, there's a sp specific area where the patients are tender, and that's usually where the stress fracture is. X-rays, uh, you know, even though we get them, are oftentimes not diagnostic unless uh, it's sometime after beginning of symptoms, and then you can actually start to see the stress fracture healing. Uh, on this picture, on the uh, all the way to the top right, you can see a stress fracture uh, in the second metatarsal, which wasn't apparent uh, in the picture to the left of it. But over time, of course, the body tries to heal this fracture, and uh, you'll actually start seeing the fracture healing but not the actual fracture itself. And that's a, that's a pretty common picture, especially in the metatarsals. When we're highly suspicious of a stress fracture but don't see one on an x-ray, uh, best test is usually an MRI. And an MRI is good because it lets us see not only the, the bones, but also the soft tissue around it. Uh, and it lets us see uh, bone marrow edema. And bone marrow edema is swelling in the bone or uh, fluid in the bone. And that's usually indicative of a contusion or a fracture. And you can see here uh, in the pictures to the bottom left how uh, this patient has a bone marrow edema inside the navicular. The patient's tender there and the um, MRI is positive. Uh, oftentimes will show a line and this is actually one of those bones where uh, surgery may be indicated depending on if the fracture is displaced at all or uh, certainly if it's uh, progressive over time. Um, CT scan can be utilized. Um, this just gives us um, a better definition of the bone uh, and provides us a 3D kind of x-ray picture. Lastly, uh, as part of our workup, we get lab values. Uh, we want to see uh, whether the patient's um, vitamin deficient uh, because this will help out with bone healing. Uh, and uh, in rare cases, uh, we have to get a bone mineral density scan to uh, uh, see whether uh, the bone is actually more prone to stress fractures due to low uh, mineral density. Uh, in terms of treatment, most of the time these can be treated non-operatively, and uh, this is with uh, a, a boot and crutches or being non-weight bearing. Sometimes uh, we can utilize what's called a bone stimulator. Science of uh, bone stimulators are kind of beyond me, but basically they utilize either pulsed electrical or ultrasound signals to help stimulate bone healing. And we use this in cases where, you know, despite using a boot and staying off it, patients are still uh, painful over a specific area. 
Uh, and it's been, you know, several weeks and, and they're really failing to respond uh, both clinically and, and radiographically. Uh, we do supplement uh, with vitamin D and calcium uh, if the patients are particularly, you know, low in both areas. And as a last resort, uh, we uh, move on to surgery. And surgery, again, we reserve for high-risk fractures. Uh, for example, again, the navicular is one area where um, I would have a low threshold to treat surgically. Um, you know, other areas further up would include the uh, shaft and the tibia, as well as the ephemeral neck. Um, these are bad because not only are they really debilitating to the patient, if these move on to full fracture, uh, it is a, a very bad, or I should say worse prognosis for the patient in regards to not only uh, the surgery outcomes, but also um, they need to be off their feet for an extended period of time. So we try to get at these uh, before they progress to full fracture. And basically, surgery addresses why the fracture isn't healing. So any fracture in the body, not even just the stress fracture, does not heal when there's too much movement or there's too little biology. And so uh, we solve the too much movement uh, problem by securing it with plates and screws once you get it in a appropriate position. And we solve the biology problem by using things like bone graft uh, or certain compounds, biologics to help stimulate uh, healing and provide the body an extra kick or or um, give it some help uh, to get the other uh, bone to heal. All right, and lastly, uh, let's move on to tendon injuries, and I'll be talking specifically about Achilles tendon injuries. Uh, the Achilles, as an overview, is the largest and strongest tendon in the human body. Uh, mostly, Achilles injuries are, are linked to overuse. Um, you know, not every Achilles injury will progress to rupture. Uh, and certainly the ones that are, uh, don't are, are usually secondary to just being beat up over time. There's a ton of terms that you might hear in regards to Achilles conditions, including tendonitis, tendinosis, uh, retrocalcaneal bursitis. Uh, in general, um, you know, you kind of treat them the same way. Uh, and lastly, uh, you can have rupture, which are, are treated a little bit differently depending on the patient. So just a quick word on anatomy, um, the Achilles tendon is made up of the confluence or the distal confluence of three muscles, the two heads of the gastrocnemius uh, muscle, as well as the soleus, which sits in front of it. These three come together uh, and insert onto the heel. We mentioned the watershed uh, zone before, uh, the watershed zone before for the fifth metatarsal. Uh, a similar one exists for the Achilles tendon. So at an area about four to seven centimeters above the insertion onto the heel, the Achilles has that watershed area. There's great blood flow above it and below it, but right around that area, the blood flow is not as, and not as good. And, uh, you know, this has, again, implications on not only being, or making it more likely to rupture, but also in terms of healing. And of course, the Achilles is uh, very important and sort of paramount in allowing us to push off uh, and uh, uh, jump. And so generally, this is a, a non-contact injury. So, uh, you know, there's the rare cases where someone's Achilles gets, uh, you know, lacerated with a, a skate while playing hockey. Uh, but in general, this happens without anybody touching, uh, touching the patient. Uh, and they'll describe a pop. Uh, and that can either be a, a, a pop that they hear or uh, a pop that they feel. Uh, I, I kind of sort of forgot to put the final word here, but it, it, a lot of times patients will describe a sensation of being kicked where, you know, you'll see videos of people kind of looking around to see who hurt them from behind and there'll be nobody there. We call this kind of a, a phantom kick phenomenon. And of course, they'll have swelling or, or ecchymosis, bruising in the area. Pain is kind of a um, variable in terms of how, how much patients experience, you know, sometimes they have a lot, sometimes they have a little, and oftentimes it's the patients that have very little pain where it can lead to a delayed diagnosis. So, uh, you know, I think this video here, hopefully it plays, uh, demonstrates, you know, how obvious sometimes this injury can be. So it, it almost sounds like a, uh, a gunshot. And, um, you know, this patient obviously knew right away and is kind of reaching for the area that hurts. 
Uh, and so hopefully they present to the office and this allows us to make a timely diagnosis. So clinically, um, there's three really uh, tests that we use. One is a palpable gap. Most of the time, especially acutely, you should be able to feel a gap in the Achilles tendon where the rupture occurs. And so I believe this video kind of shows me in the operating with a patient where I'm just sort of running my finger over the Achilles tendon uh, and seeing, um, uh, and you'll see my finger kind of drop into an area. And if you do that through your, to your own Achilles tendon, provided it's not torn, you know, obviously it won't do that. So, uh, you know, just kind of running it across, you can see right at that point right there where that watershed zone is, my finger is dropping into the, uh, the gap right there. That's an obvious sign of a, uh, a rupture. Um, the Thompson's test, which I'll show on my next slide, uh, is a test we use where basically we squeeze the calf. And if you squeeze the calf and the foot goes down or plantar flexes, that's the normal response. If there's no continuity of the Achilles tendon, then, that, then obviously will not happen. And finally, there's uh, decreased resting tone. So the picture to the right, you'll see the right side or the right leg has a normal Achilles tendon. Normally when we lie down uh, and take all the tension off, the foot wants to assume a plantar flex position and you can see the outline of the Achilles tendon. On a foot that uh, has an Achilles tendon rupture, uh, it has more length and therefore it's gonna be more dorsiflexed or have the uh, toes pointing more toward the, uh, the head. And in terms of diagnosis, really time is of the essence. And I'll explain why in later slides, but you really wanna see somebody as soon as you can. You do not want this to become a missed injury or a delay in diagnosis. So this is the Thompson's test over here. You know, I start by squeezing. Uh, this is the normal side right here. And this is the abnormal side. You can see there's no response there. Uh, uh, and this is just, uh, again, a demonstration uh, comparing ruptured side and non-ruptured side. So physical exam is important. I always get an x-ray because you do want to rule out certain situations that can present similar to an Achilles tendon rupture that actually present a much more serious problem. And this includes what we call an avulsion, where uh, instead of rupturing at the tendon itself, uh, the bone actually pulls off. And you can see in this middle picture here, you know, when this happens, this can put a tremendous amount of pressure on the skin overlying it and, and even progress to an open fracture and certainly can cause the skin above the die. And that's, uh, this picture in the middle right here is uh, sort of a, I'm getting uh, up in the middle of the night and come to the hospital. But I see this because this is something that has to be addressed uh, almost immediately. Um, acute cases do not need an MRI. In fact, uh, patient presenting with an MRI is one of the reasons why, uh, one of the main reasons why we see delay in diagnosis most cases do not need one. It's fairly obvious on, um, you know, exam. Uh, but if it's later on, three or four weeks after an injury, I do get an MRI and ultrasound because this lets us plan as, uh, in terms of how big the gap is uh, that can occur as the rupture gets older and what other uh, injuries are around it. Um, and so, you know, the, the question is, of course, do we treat this with surgery or without? Uh, advantages of surgery are there's a lower re-rupture rate. Uh, and that, you know, in terms of bringing the uh, tendon ends together at the exact length you want, that gives you a much more reliable outcome and a higher push-off strength. Of course, the disadvantages are uh, wound issues uh, and the risks of surgery, anesthesia risks, um, uh, you know, risks of, um, you, you know, developing an infection, uh, DBA and thrombosis afterwards. Um, these are all risks inherent to surgery. And so without surgery, we treat with a boot. Uh, this boot is wedges inside that uh, just by putting the uh, foot in that position brings the two ends together. And, you know, I tell patients it's the same setback. You know, you're still non-weight bearing for a couple of weeks. Then you have to use the boot in total for, you know, usually a little bit over two months. And then you start physical therapy around that time. Gradually, you drop more and more wedges until your foot's in that flat position. Uh, and so that's basically the same protocol as for surgery. Um, and again, it avoids wound complications. You know, this can happen in, in depending on which study you read, up to 10% of patients. Um, you know, patients that are, are diabetics or smoke or obese or are really kind of non-compliant with post-operative care um, are, are more likely to experience these problems. Uh, certainly poor surgical technique where you're really 
stretching in, uh, on the skin and pulling on it. Uh, but generally, you know, for patients um, described you know, such as diabetics or smokers, we tend to avoid surgery anyway because of the increased risk. <clears throat> Biomechanically, there's a lower re-rupture rate, uh, and that's um, secondary to the fact that you're able to get the Achilles tendon to the exact length you want. If you don't have the Achilles tendon, sorry, heels in the length and position, you're not going to be able to have the same push-off strength, and that's because you're not restoring the normal length and resting tension of the Achilles tendon. And so, uh, as a final note here, we'll just kind of go through operative treatment. You know, in terms of acute ruptures, traditionally um, done to the open technique. Um, you know, I say outdated here, and that, that's not necessarily true. Uh, it just isn't necessary in most cases, especially when they present when patients come in right away. Uh, and it's pretty simple. You expose the, uh, make an incision over the area, you expose the uh, rupture, and you take the end above it and the end below it, and you kind of bring it together. Now, obviously, you have to be able to make an incision long enough to get enough suture above and below, and that's why, for the most part, these require a longer incision. Um, and, you know, if done right, again, uh, I think there's no data to show that it's at increased risk uh, compared to uh, the minimally invasive techniques, but um, certainly the if you can limit the extent of the incision, uh, we try to do so. And uh, really, I've moved on to using uh, this technique. Really, it's utilizing a special jig to kind of help pass sutures without having to make a, a long incision. In fact, sometimes we can make a incision going across, which is not only much shorter uh, in length, but also much more uh, cosmetically appealing. Um, we secure the sutures and, and then subsequently uh, uh, bring it back down uh, and secure it uh, not only to the other tendon with suture, but also uh, with screws in the, uh, the heel bone. Uh, which provides not only tendon to tendon healing, but uh, uh, also allows us to secure it to the bone and have added fixation. Uh, and so, again, can be done with very, very small incisions, uh, you know, usually one transverse incision up top and two smaller ones up by the heel. Uh, this is one where, I, you know, we used a longitudinal or straight incision, but you can see how, uh, how much smaller compared to an open incision this has. And of course, uh, your goal at the end is to establish a normal Achilles tendon. And uh, you know, this is a post-surgery for the same patient as I've seen before. Uh, you can see how the patient now is a normal Thompson's test. So post-operatively, I won't go through this too much, but basically you wanna protect your repair. You don't wanna have the, the patient stretch it out too soon. So you utilize a boot with wedges. You can usually start weight bearing right away, or I should say at two weeks and then you drop a wedge every couple weeks until you hit neutral. And then at that point, you start physical therapy. Generally, patients uh, return to sports at about a year, nine months to a year. And you'll see this uh, many times over in professional sports. Usually patients, uh, uh, I should say athletes, uh, return to play about a year after their injury. And uh, finally, you, know, you don't wanna let these go on too long uh, without diagnosing them. As the injuries get older, the tendon uh, on the top or the tendon at the top starts pulling upwards, and this leads to a greater and greater gap. Obviously, at this point, there's no way to be able to bring them together without somehow lengthening the tendon above it. Uh, and so, you know, we plan for that with an MRI. Uh, we also have to shave off whatever uh, uh, factor may have caused it in the first place, such as a bone spur in the back of the ankle. Uh, and so this is an example of a patient that came in um, two months after her injury. Uh, and, you know, by the time I saw her, she had about a gap of over 10 centimeters. There was very little distal tendon or tendon toward the heel left. And there was a very large uh, uh, gap, approximately 10 centimeters above. So in this case, um, you know, you can see the amount of gap present. We do what's called a turn down. We take a, a piece of the tendon above and sort of flip it underneath, and so that bridges the, the gap and becomes a new tendon over here. And um, you can see here uh, uh, on the video where uh, the patient's just undergone this procedure and has a normal Achilles function afterwards. All right, and that's it right there. Uh, you know, I'll answer whatever questions uh, popped up, but I want to thank everybody for your time today uh, and for joining us um, uh, for this presentation.
Great, yeah, so I'll give uh, time for everybody to um, ask some questions. Um, so I'll just give a moment for people to type out. Okay, I guess if there's um, no questions at this time, uh, we can definitely conclude today's lecture. Oh, I got one. <laughs> how, uh, how do you approach reconstruction of the arch for a supinated foot? Do you use elastic elements to mimic the navicular, navicular sling ligament, or is it more rigid steel fixtures? Uh, that's a good question. So it kind of depends. I mean, uh, so... For a patient that's flat-footed, uh, where you have collapse of uh, the spring ligament and the uh, arch of the foot, um, the question always is, how flexible is it? Uh, meaning, can we get the arch back in the office by shifting the heel around and uh, using things like orthotics? If the joints are still flexible, then you can reconstruct it using a combination of you know, uh, bone cuts and uh, soft tissue procedures. Uh, examples would be things like calcaneal osteotomies, where you cut the bone, the heel bone, and move it over, uh, as well as tightening up the spring ligament or transferring a tendon to help out with the usually deficient posterior tibialis tendon. It's when you have really kind of an arthritic or very collapsed, rigid, uh, deformed arch that's flattened, and no matter what you do in the office, you can't get it over. That's when we need to do uh, what's called, you know, uh, arthrodesis or rigid treatment where we basically break up all the joints that are involved in forming the arch, put them in a better position uh, to recreate the arch and use plates and screws uh, to secure it. Obviously, you know, we try to do the, the former uh, reconstruction as opposed to fusion whenever possible. Just gonna double check chat, see if there's any questions there. Um, is there anything that you do to help someone with rigid foot, rigid foot that is not enough elasticity? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, with the foot, it's it's tough because unlike other parts of the body where, uh, you know, replace, replacements exist, such as the hip or the knee, in the foot, once someone's developed rigidity, and a lot of times that's secondary to arthritis, our, our options are a little bit more limited. You know, certain parts of the body you can address through joint replacements or half joint replacements. That includes the ankle, of course, uh, as well as the uh, what we call the hallux MTP joint or the big toe joint. But, uh, but for the most part, uh, our, our aim is to, um, you know, s reduce pain, uh, which often accompanies rigidity uh, by fusing the joint or from a non-surgical standpoint, by supporting it with things like orthotics um, or specialized shoes. All right, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sai, for your time this evening. Thank you, everybody, for uh, taking the time to join us this evening. Uh, for more information, you can contact either myself or my counterpart, Jen, uh, or if you'd like to make an appointment with one of our physicians in the future or with Dr. Sai directly, feel free to visit us online at Rothman. Oh, we have one more question. <laughs> uh, do you typically find most bunionectomies ever regain normal uh, DF or MTP joint. Mm -hmm. What would your uh, what would your approach be? 
Uh, it's tough. I mean, you definitely have to counsel patients. I mean, by fixing a bunion, um, you are to some degree answering the, the joint or you're looking at the joint as, as part of your procedure. Now, there's minimally invasive techniques nowadays that limit that amount uh, that you're kind of violating the joint. Um, so I do find, yes, patients eventually do, although it's usually at a later uh, time than they initially would, would, um, would think. So, uh, you know, usually months rather than weeks after surgery where, you know, the joints got gotten back down to a manageable size and, and they're moving it around as much as they did before surgery. Perfect. Um, as I was saying, for more information, if you'd like to make an appointment with uh, uh, Dr. Sai or any of our other physicians, feel free to visit us online at rothmanny.com. Uh, or you may call us at 888-636-7840. And uh, just as a reminder, we will be sending out this recording to all of our registrants within the next few days. So please be on the lookout for that email. Thank you, everybody. Take care.